Good morning. And we're happy to have you join us today for our SEOW event, the 3D Delaware Data Discourse. If you wouldn't mind, please sign into the chat. Let us know if you've ever used the EPI report and if you have, how you might have used it. But just to introduce yourselves, we're grateful to see everybody coming in so early this morning. Thank you. We'll get started in a minute. It's great to see, we see some familiar faces, but we're also seeing a lot of new faces today. Hi, Dr. Martins, how are you? Fine, thank you, and how about you? Good, we're good. We're gonna give everybody a minute to come in and get settled. Folks are still coming in. I see Sarah Bear, hello, Alexa. Valeria, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing your name, but it's good to see you back. Um, I think uh, we some new folks from Courageous Hearts. Hi there, Jeff and Sergeant Wilson, Dr. Lev. It's great to have you join us today. I did. Okay, great, Val Valeria. Feel free to, uh, while we're in our introductory phase, everybody can unmute themselves and say good morning if they'd like. Um, we'll get started in about a minute. Good morning, glad to be here. It's my first meeting. Looking forward. Great. It's wonderful. Hi, this is Katie Capelli. I'm the Office of Health Crisis Response Division of Public Health. Hi, Katie. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Well, uh, and I... Um, I think that we should probably get started. I know folks are going to drift in because even though, you know, we're still in the Zoom world, we know that if you end a meeting at 11 and you start a meeting at 11, you can't be in two places at once. So we're going to go ahead, I think, and start. Um, my name is Sharon Merriman Nye, and I'm with the Center for Drug and Health Studies and the SEOW. Um, I'm here today hosting with uh, Dr. Rachel Riding. She is also a member of the SEOW facilitator team and working at the Center for Drug and Health Studies. Um, Rachel, you'll hear from in a little while. I'm gonna do the uh, opening part of our session today. Um, and Rachel will be actually the one that's walking through the data and sharing a lot about the specifics of the EPI report that we're going to highlight. Um, if you haven't, please sign in to the chat, let us know. Um, if you've ever used the EPI report, or if you, if you have a particular interest in this for some reason, um, please share what you'd like. Uh, we're going to get started. Rachel, I'm going to ask you to advance slides for me if you'll go on to the next one. Okay, now before we get started, I have a personal disclaimer to make, and that is that for some reason, today of all days, my computer decided to go a little screwy. So hopefully the problem is resolved, but I will apologize up front for any glitches. And if that happens, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel much quicker than I thought. <laughs> so um, just, uh, this is just a little bit about the background of the EPI, the State Epidemiological Outcomes Work Group, which is known as the SEOW because it's far too much to have to keep repeating. And uh, this particular work group has um, been funded for many years through the Delaware Department of Health and Social Services, the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. And that is through funding from the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, SEOWs were originally created as part of the um, Strategic Prevention Framework Grants. And there were a number of them established throughout the United States. Um, and all of the SEOWs share the four common goals. We identify, analyze, and share data that can be used for a number of different uh, purposes in terms of planning, program planning, program delivery, evaluation, and policy development, um, all relating to behavioral health. 
We also create data products, such as the data product that we're going to be discussing today, the annual epidemiological report for the state of Delaware. Uh, if you want to go back a second, Rachel. Um, uh, the other two goals are to train communities and stakeholders in understanding and using the data because it doesn't do us any good to have wonderful data and not apply it. So we know folks need to understand where to find the data and how they can use it to support their work. And finally, the ultimate goal is to be able to develop a very robust uh, state and local level monitoring system so that we can keep our eye on trends and concerns, emerging issues that are happening relevant to behavioral health. It also allows us to monitor where we are doing well and where we've had some successes and improvements. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we're going to talk about uh, the, the largest and most comprehensive of our reports, um, our data products today. It's the, um, the annual Delaware Epidemiological Profile. And we refer to that as the EPI. And this report collates information on trends and patterns in substance use, mental health, risk and protective factors, and special topics. Um, this report is very valuable for a number of reasons. You can use it when you're developing needs assessments, applying for grant funding, um, evaluating, you know, planning your evaluation methods, conducting evaluation, and also for outreach presentations, public awareness, media, anything where you're trying to communicate what is happening along the lines of behavioral health in Delaware. Um, we we uh, try to cover as many data sources as we possibly can to get the most comprehensive picture of what's happening. Um, the 2021 report includes over 165 figures from over 40 data sources. So on the left, you see the data sets that we tend to dive into more deeply. And on the right, these are additional data references that we use when we're actually compiling the report. Dick, next slide. In addition to the EPI report, we know that it's helpful to have uh, very quick handouts that you can use to convey um, information about specific topics. So we develop and update an annual series of infographics based on this information. These and all of our products are available on the SEOW website. And Bill Gratton, who is also on the SEOW team, is going to be popping different links into the chat. We'll circulate these after the meeting so that you will have access to all of this. But all of these infographics are included, are easy for you to download. You can distribute them electronically or print them, take them to meetings, incorporate them into presentations, however it serves you. Next slide. And finally, we create a deck of PowerPoint slides from the graphs and figures in the EPI report. And again, this is to enhance your ability to um, you know, strengthen your presentations and the work that you're doing when you're engaging with your stakeholders. Next slide. So we've been doing the EPI report for over 10 years now at the Center for Drug and Health Studies at the University of Delaware. Um, we've tried over the years to continue to improve it, particularly the user friendliness of it, and, and, and we've sought input from the SEOW stakeholders um, to get their input about, we wanted to know what would help you, what would make it stronger. So one of the things that we found out a few years ago is that there was um, a desire for uh, illustrations of how the data is, you know, useful in terms of policy or um, how we can take a deeper dive into it and, and look a little bit more at how the data points interrelate to one another. So we created data in action segments for a number of the chapters. And um, this year we focused, not surprisingly, on the impact of the COVID pandemic uh, on behavioral health. So each of the data in action segments relate to that. The second feature that I wanted to mention is that we added for the first time highlight or call out, call out boxes at the beginning of each of the chapters. 
Um, every chapter opens with a narrative that provides an overview of the data that is to follow. And we wanted to be able to, at a glance, give folks the opportunity to see what we think are the key takeaways for that particular topic. And the final um, new addition to this report is one that I find very personally exciting because I also work with Trauma Matters Delaware. And I know that many of the folks uh, on this call are interested and aware of the impact of trauma and ACEs on behavioral health and physical health. Um, so we've added, <clears throat> for a number of years, we've had an ACEs chapter, and we've included several sources of youth data um, on ACEs and trauma. However, it's been a number of years since we've had any recent data for adults in this regard. In 2019, uh, the Delaware Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or the BRFIS, included the ACEs module in their um, survey. So we are able to report that data for the first time. And we're very excited about that, particularly because we know it has a lifelong association with other aspects of health and well-being. Next slide. And before I turn it over to Rachel, I just want to talk a little bit about the differences in this report in terms of some of the data sources. Um, for many years, we've observed a trend of declining school level participation in some of our youth surveys. We, um, we draw data from the CDC's uh, Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is administered every other year to middle and high school students. And we also have um, a CDC survey on the opposite years, that is the Youth Tobacco Survey. And that's administered uh, to students in middle and high school as well. And then we have the Delaware School Survey, which is an annual survey that's local to our state. Um, the trends were going down before we hit the pandemic. And then the pandemic came and there were school shutdowns. So there's been a lot of disruption to the ability to collect data. And as a result, we do not have um, some of the data sources for the years 2019 and 2020 that we previously did have. The good news is that we have a lot of engaged stakeholders who are um, working with the SEOW, with the, the youth survey team at the Center for Drug and Health Studies, and really trying to generate um, uh, an increased engagement with these surveys. Um, we look forward, I believe we're going to have these data sources incorporated back into the next edition. Um, we report everything that we can, the most recent data that we can. We've also drawn upon the YRBS, uh, the CDC YRBS data portal online. And there's also the ability for folks on the call, if they're interested, to reach out to the Delaware Division of Public uh, health through their um, information and request process, which we've posted the link on the website um, in here. And we encourage you to do that if you have questions about anything that's not in this report. Um, but I did want to make mention of that. Uh, we will reincorporate all of these data sources when we have the ability to do that. We're looking forward to more robust samples this year. We know that we've had much more success in the past year or so in being able to collect that data. So. I, I have one more final um, note that I want to share with you all, and that is that today's session is just to present an overview of what the EPI is and some highlights of each of the chapters. We couldn't possibly go through in depth all of the findings in the report because it's massive. So um, when you're look when you're listening to Rachel discuss different things, she's going to be selecting different examples of the kinds of things that we report out on, and some of the more salient findings. What we would encourage you to do, though, is that after this, you go into the report, you take a deeper dive, and you reach back out to us with any questions. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. And I will um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end for some questions. So thank you again for joining us and thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Sharon. Um, so I will be talking a bit more about 
um, some of the data that's actually in the EPI report as um, Sharon so wonderfully introduced. Um, and, and to start off, um, I'm just going to quickly run through a few notes on some of the practices that we use when we're reporting on data in the EPI report um, and things you should keep in mind when interpreting some of this data. Um, and this is, um, I'm gonna go through this quickly because it can be a lot of information, um, but this is um, our, our notes on our data reporting is also at the front of the EPI report if you um, download the actual report, if you want to look at any of this a little bit more closely um, when you're reviewing the report later. And you can feel free to email me as well um, if you have any questions about this. Um, but one of the things to keep in mind is that um, we don't report statistics when numbers are too small. Um, so when thinking about like school surveys, for example, um, we might have some questions or some subgroups of students we're trying to look at that end up having really small numbers and it's hard to produce reliable statistics out of um, a group of 10 students that fit some sort of category. Um, so we typically don't report um, statistics on um, any subgroup where the raw number of students involved is less than 30 students. Um, and we also round our percentages to the nearest whole percent um, in terms of missing observations with the school surveys, um, the surveys can be kind of long, so students don't always um, complete the entire survey or students might quit, skip certain questions. Um, so there, there's always some degree of missing data in the surveys and these missing observations are typically dropped from our analysis. Um, so this is another area where um, there might be potential um, discrepancies or differences um, when we start rounding percentages or looking at things um, in terms of you know, the percent of students that we're reporting versus how many students actually may have started taking the survey. Um, we, in the EPI report, we also typically denote whether or not a statistic um, has a statistical significance. Um, so we'll, we'll report correlations if they're statistically significant at the um, 0.05 level and we'll note if they're not statistically significant in the school surveys in which we're doing our analysis. Um, and, and again, like I mentioned, there might be small discrepancies in reporting um, in data where we're doing our own analysis versus another data source. And typically this is maybe a percentage point and it will come down to a difference in how missing data was treated or how something was rounded. Um, so if you see something like that and ever have questions about it, feel free to reach out. And usually it's just these, these small differences in um, how we might treat some of the data. Um, and we do report um, some of our data sources are weighted, um, like the YRBS data is typically weighted. Um, and when data is weighted, that will always be noted in a graph in the EPI report. Um, so now that, you know, kind of data housekeeping stuff is out of the way, I'm going to go over um, just a few key um, findings that we want wanted to kind of highlight from this year's EPI report. Um, and again, as Sharon mentioned, this is by no means a comprehensive look at everything that's in the report. Um, the report has so much information in it. It's over 100 figures, 13 chapters. Um, it's a lot of information. So this is really meant to just give a snapshot, a highlight of some of the things that you can expect to find in the EPI report, and then maybe spark some interest in you all wanting to look deeper into the report yourselves at some of the information we have within it. Um, so our EPI report has 13 chapters now. Um, the first six chapters um, are focused on specific types of substance use as well as a um, demographic overview of the state of Delaware and some of the census data um, in terms of population of the state and things like that. And we also have some um, heat maps that show um, you know, hotspots and, and trends in um, certain substance use by geographic region in the state. Um, and then chapter seven through 13 focus a little bit more on special topics and subgroups that we want to pay specific attention to, um, such as infants with prenatal substance exposure, um, other behavioral issues like gambling, um, mental health and wellness, um, people with disabilities in Delaware, ACEs, protective factors, and also gender and sexual diversity. So um, as, as Sharon mentioned, um, and I just want to circle back to, we, we did have a number of issues with um, having access 
to data in the 2021 EPI report. Um, and there's a combination of problems with declining survey participation over the years, but also just the limitations of the pandemic. Um, it's difficult to collect school survey data when schools are not meeting or operating under um, certain constraints or not allowing visitors to come and administer surveys. Um, so all of those things impacted the data that we were able to analyze and put into this year's report. Um, so typically in our state demographic overview chapter, we would be providing um, fifth and eighth grade and 11th grade data on some of these substance use trends. Um, and in this figure, we were only able to produce eighth grade, um, but it's still interesting to highlight and um, to look at that among eighth grade students, um, as typical for most previous years, um, alcohol and vaping and marijuana are the top three uh, most prevalent substances that were reported used by these students in the past year. Um, and then followed behind that is medication used not as prescribed. Um, so this would include um, prescription medications as well as um, steroids or over-the-counter medicines that are being used not as prescribed. Um, in our tobacco and electronic cigarettes chapter, um, you know, again, there's a lot of data in this chapter. Um, we've seen over the years declining um, use of cigarettes and increasing use of vaping devices. And what we wanted to highlight in this presentation is also this, um, the disparate perception of risk that youth have um, for smoking cigarettes compared to using vaping devices. Um, so, you know, statewide, about 46% of eighth grade students report that there's a, a great risk from smoking um, a pack of cigarettes a day, um, whereas only about 28% of students um, perceive that there's a great risk from, from vaping. So we know that, um, you know, a lot of the health risks for vaping are still unknown long term, but that there's these um, disparate perceptions among young people as to what the potential risks might be from um, using these substances that we've seen such great increases in use in over the past few years. Um, and with alcohol, what we've seen um, over the years, this is one of our trend charts looking um, back from 1999 to present. And, and again, this is comparing um, eighth and 11th grade, although we didn't have 11th grade data um, in 2020, we just had eighth grade data. So you'll see that, um, you know, this, this trend kind of, the line kind of stops a little early, but we're, um, we will have 2021 data to add back into this. So these will even out a little bit. But, um, you know, we do see that in general over time, um, past month alcohol use has slowly um, declined among eighth grade students. Um, it seems to have hit kind of a plateau with eighth graders over the last five years hovering around eight or 9% um, and 7% in 2020. Um, but this is a, a figure that has been more or less decreasing rather than increasing over the years, which we see as a positive trend. Um, we also see with um, marijuana, again, looking at perception of risk that over time, um, the perception of risk in using marijuana among um, students has also declined, um, which isn't necessarily something that we would like to see. Um, so there's been a few, a few spikes over time, um, but, but more or less um, among eighth grade students, which is who we have 2020 data for, um, the perception of great risk in using marijuana regularly is about 33% now. Um, so only about one in three students um, perceive that using marijuana regularly is a risky activity. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of um, data from different data sources on opioids and prescription misuse, and we're still very much um, in the midst of an opioid overdose epidemic. Um, but we have seen, and looking at um, Delaware Prescription Monitoring Program, that um, trends in people filling opioid prescriptions in Delaware um, have been decreasing over the last several years. So this chart looks at different, um, different types of opioid prescriptions um, and the rate of prescriptions per 1,000 people. Um, and among all categories except for treatment-related opioids, um, we have seen declines in the, the rates of prescriptions, um, which is something that we would like to see. Um, you know, this suggests that, you know, prescriptions are going down, but that folks are 
being um, getting into medication assisted treatment when they do have opioid use disorders. We wouldn't want to see the treatment related opioid use necessarily go down. So that's positive. Um, and then we also wanted to highlight, you know, we have some overdose data in this chapter as well. Um, and, you know, in 2020 and in the pandemic, overdose deaths have, have really spiked. Um, and in 2020, there were um, 447 overdose deaths in Delaware, and fentanyl was identified in 372 of those, which is about 83, 84% of overdose deaths in Delaware involved SEOW, uh, or not involved SEOW, I'm sorry, I'm seeing the chat too. Um, but about 83, 84% of those overdose deaths involved fentanyl. Um, which suggests that you know we have a really bad problem of contaminated um, drug supply, and this is really really dangerous for people who are using drugs. Um, we've also, um, in the last few years, included a chapter on infants with prenatal substance exposure, um, and got some more recent data to update this this chapter this year um, about the um, number of notifications for infant prenatal substance exposure in 2020. Um, and in 2020, there were 702 cases in Delaware where there was reported prenatal substance exposure. Um, and, and the positive out of this is that in the vast majority of these, um, 653 of these cases, plans of safe care were prepared um, for the families involved. Um, and in more than half of these, the father was also involved in the plan of safe care. Um, so this is a pretty positive um, look at how um, we can successfully intervene in these cases and make sure that, you know, safe plans are, are set up for, for these families and children to have the best possible outcomes. Um, and, and one of our special topics chapters is um, gambling. And, and we typically look at, um, you know, students who report gambling in the past year, uh, which includes playing the lottery or scratch off tickets, betting on fantasy port, sports, betting on individual sports teams, playing bingo for money, betting on dice games, betting money on a challenge, playing online gambling games, um, betting on video games, those kinds of things. Um, so we look at students who have reported any of those gambling behaviors in the past year. And then if there are associations between substance use or poor mental health outcomes like depression or anxiety. Um, so we're highlighting here that among students who report gambling in the past year, they also report much higher rates of substance use in the past year. Um, so there is a, a, a positive association between gambling and engaging in um, substance use and potentially other risk behavior, which is an important thing to highlight and could be a point of intervention for young people. Um, we also look at mental health and, and wellness. Um, and, and on the, the Delaware School Survey, um, we asked students if they felt nervous or anxious on more than half the days in the past two weeks. And then we also asked them if they felt um, down or depressed or hopeless more than half the days in the past two weeks. And then we can look at these as a kind of a proxy for um, feelings of anxiety or feelings of depression. Um, and we found, you know, high rates of feelings of anxiety and depression, but we also found that those are much higher for female students compared to male students. Um, so 28% of female eighth grade students reported um, these feelings of anxiety in the past two weeks compared to only 11% of male students. And with depression, there's a similar disparity in 23% of female students are reporting feeling depressed, whereas only 9% of male students are reporting feeling depressed. Um, so again, there's um, it's pretty disparate responses by, by gender and potential opportunities for intervention there um, in thinking about how female students may be experiencing some of these things different from male students. Um, with disabilities, one of the things we wanted to highlight was um, some of the adult BRFAS data, this is the um, behavioral risk factor surveillance sur system, um, kind of the, the adult version of the YRBS. Um, and we have 2019 data available for, for this survey. Hopefully the upcoming up your report will have 2020 data. Um, but in looking at you know, adults with disabilities in, in Delaware, um, we also see a disparity in rates of um, 
smoking and binge drinking and poor mental health outcomes as well um, among adults with disabilities compared to adults without disabilities. Um, so adults with disabilities are reporting being current um, cigarette smokers at more than twice the rate of students or adults without disabilities. Um, and we see even um, more severe differences when looking at rates of having depression or feeling mentally unhealthy among adults with disability compared to um, adults without disabilities. So these bottom two rows here. Um, and then we also report on adverse childhood experiences. Um, and in this year, with the, um, some of the data lim limitations, um, you know, in, in previous years, we've used um, YRBS data to, to try and look at ACEs, but we didn't have weightable, usable YRBS data to include in this year's report. Um, so we created a slightly different indicator to look at ACEs um, using the Delaware School Survey. Um, so we were able to put together nine indicators to aggregate into a variable to approximate ACEs. Um, and this includes students who report um, being homeless or having housing insecurity, um, being bullied, having an incarcerated parent um, who report being hit by an adult, um, who have lived with someone with a severe mental illness or someone who has attempted suicide, um, who see or hear violence between adults in their home, um, who have ever lived with someone with a substance use or alcohol use disorder, um, who've been hit by another teenager, another young person, or who've been bullied at school. Um, and then we're able to put these together into an indicator to look at students who have experienced zero of these things, one of these things, two of these things, or three or more of these things. Um, and, and while, you know, about a third, a little over a third of students, you know, haven't experienced any of these um, forms of trauma, um, the majority of students have experienced at least one of these things and nearly a quarter have experienced three or more. Um, and then when we look at outcomes for students, such as their uh, mental health and, and wellness or, or their substance use or other risk behavior, those outcomes tend to be worse for the students who have experienced an accumulation of these types of traumatic incidences. Um, and then we also have um, a, a gender and sexuality chapter. And this is another chapter where um, we didn't have a whole lot of um, new Delaware data to report on in 2020 and 2021 because of um, some of the data limitations. So, so in this chapter in the EPI report, um, in, in this chapter in the EPI report, we um, included some national um, data on LGBTQ youth, um, but didn't update any of the Delaware data. Um, but in next year, um, next year's report, which we are beginning to work on, we do have um, a new administration of Delaware school survey data that does ask students about their sexual orientation. We're beginning to be able to look at this. Um, so, so what I have here on this screen is a, a new infographic that we've put together in the past month um, as kind of a, a preview of some of the analysis we will be doing for Delaware LGBTQ youth. Um, and in the 2021 administration of the survey, there was a sexual orientation question, but not a gender identity question. And we're hopeful that in the future, in the 2022 administration, we'll be able to add um, a gender identity question to that survey, which is why this infographic um, only has LGBTQ youth, but is missing the T. Um, but what we found um, when looking at, you know, LGBTQ youth and um, how they perceive their, their well-being, how they perceive how well they're doing right now and how, they, how well they think they'll be doing in the future, um, LGBTQ students compared to their heterosexual students um, are, are reporting much higher rates of what we would classify as suffering um, and, and struggling compared to thriving. Um, so if we look at, um, for example, on the um, you know, left side here, we have um, students reporting how they perceive their well-being now. Um, and for 11th grade students, um, about 41% of students are um, in this suffering range compared to about 15% of heterosexual students. Um, so a pretty, pretty stark disparity in terms of perceptions of, of how well they're doing. Um, so again, more analysis on this particular topic will be coming in next year's EPI report, but we wanted to touch on it a little bit now 
um, explain why we didn't have a whole lot of new data, but also preview some of the stuff that will be coming in the next report. Um, and then our final chapter in the EPI report is um, focused on protective factors. So the, the factors that help mitigate some of the negative it, outcomes from um, some of the ACEs and, and some of the trauma students might experience and some of the factors that we know might help promote resilience among students. Um, and one of those things we know is that having um, strong sources of support and encouragement in your life is a positive protective factor. Um, and we see among eighth grade students that you know the vast majority do feel that they have um, you know sources of support and encouragement from their fam from their parents, um, and about two thirds have that from friends. A little less than half also feel that from teachers. Um, but we still have about one in twenty students who are reporting that they have no one that provides them with a source of support and encouragement, um, which is which is pretty devastating to think about because that's you know one or two students in every class of kids. Um, if you're thinking about a class with thirty or forty kids, um, says they have no one. Um, and, and we also continue to include some data from the National Survey of Children's Health, um, and they have this neat indicator um, trying to measure family resilience. So looking at um, the qualities that a family um, demonstrates, such as talking together about what to do about problems, working together to solve problems, um, knowing that we have strengths to draw upon, um, staying hopeful in difficult times. Um, and they put these different factors together and into an indicator to then look at um, you know, how many families are, are practicing all of these all of these things that could be measures of, of resilience in difficult times. Um, and they found that about 82% of families are practicing all four of these things um, all or most of the time, which is again pretty overwhelmingly positive. Um, and that's it for our, our data presentation. I, I know it looked like we got a few um, questions in, in the chat, um, so I'm going to scroll back through the chat and make sure those have been um, answered. And then if um, other folks do have questions, um, we've got a little bit of time to answer some questions if you do. I know we went through a, a lot of data there very quickly. And again, this is not by no means a comprehensive look at the entire EPI report. It's just kind of a, a preview or overview of everything that we have. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Sharon now. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That was a lot of information <clears throat> in a very short period of time. I appreciate um, how concisely you provided that. Um, we have had a couple of questions come up in the portal, and um, at this point, I'm, I'm just going to go over one of them. Uh, Annie Salise asked the question relevant to uh, depression, the depression slide, about whether or not we asked if folks ever got angry, because sometimes depression is channeled through anger. Um, there, Bill posted in the chat that there were a couple of questions uh, that ask about feelings, one feeling sad, empty, hopeless, or hopeless, angry, or anxious, but that doesn't tease specifically out, um, you know, anger. So that was an interesting um, note. I think that's really interesting, Annie. I don't, I don't see uh, Rochelle Brittingham on, on the, you know, in the room um, who actually is the leader of the school youth surveys um, in terms of uh, the, the administration of the surveys at the center. And um, that's an interesting piece of feedback. And I think we'll give that, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and provide her with that information. But I think that's really an important point. And Annie, if you would like to say anything else about that, I'm, I'm happy, I'd like to turn the microphones over to everyone in the room now to ask questions and to, make comments about the things that they might have thought were noteworthy in this discussion. We do have one more question in the chat too that I think we we missed. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I interrupted yeah, we'll someone go. else starting to speak. <laughs> Annie, was that you? I, yeah, I was just gonna thank you and say, just to follow up to explain, um, we teach youth mental health first aid and the previous iteration of the course, uh, it was updated in 2020, but previous to that, there was a slide deck um, 
that the, the, it introduced some of the data around the purpose of youth mental health first aid. And there was something similar that showed that, that really vast difference between males and females in adolescence when it comes to depression and anxiety. And what tended to um, transpire as a conversation is that it might not be that males don't feel those feelings, it just might be that their understanding or their words around those symptoms are different. And anger is often associated with, or, or can be associated with depression and sometimes um, presents with males in that way as a, a predominant symptom. I'm not a clinician, so please don't <laughs> take this with a grain of salt, but just as an educator, that was sort of my, my uh, request around asking that very explicit question. Um, perhaps males would respond to that um, more directly. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a, a really great point. And, um, and actually, may I say one more thing? I'm sorry. I should not specify by gender because I actually, first of all, it's just not the right thing to do. But second of all, there are, uh, you know, youth of any gender who might have the predominant feelings of anger and not ever feel sadness, yet they have a diagnosis tied to these uh, symptoms. Thanks. No, that, that is a really good point. And um, we're going to, we'll make sure that um, Dr. Brittingham hears that feedback. Um, annually, there is a meeting where we ask for input. When I say we, I used to work on the surveys, but I no longer do. Um, but uh, there's a team of folks at the center who work on the surveys along with public health and the CDC and, um, you know, they seek input on questions and how questions are developed and asked and that sort of thing. So that's good feedback. I, I did see another question in the chat and um, I think that was from, I think it was from Alexa. Alexa. Yeah, I can read the question. Okay. If you'd like, I have it in front of me. Um, can you speak more about the instructions and guidance given to students for the ACE questions? It is my understanding that the traditional ACE questionnaire asks individuals to consider experiences before their 18th birthday. Eighth graders are considerably younger than this. Yes. Um, I, you know, I think, Bill, you had the survey, um, you had the Delaware School survey up. It isn't it isn't presented um, in a unit or like a module. These are questions that have been incorporated over the years that correspond to different ACE categories. So I think that there are just, um, I think Bill, if you could pull up that um, and respond to that question about how that, there's like a grid of questions and folks are asked to rate themselves on these different indicators. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit, Sharon. Um, Cause Great. these, because these questions, um, you know, they're not put into the survey as an ACEs module or presented to students as ACEs. Um, they are really individually asked questions um, about some of these different things. Um, and, and some of them are given as in different time frames. So I think the homelessness, housing and security question asks students um, if they've experienced um, that in the past 30 days, whereas some of the other questions like living with someone with a substance use disorder or, some, or an adult with mental illness are asked as, you know, have you ever lived in one of these scenarios? So I think when, when thinking about the ACEs questions, um, and I could have framed this better in, in my slides as, as well, and we do discuss this a bit in the narrative in this chapter, um, these really are a, an approximation of ACEs, but not necessarily a one-to-one -one alignment with how um, the <coughs> ACEs study was initially done, because we do know that um, ACEs as they've traditionally been studied and especially in those landmark studies were adults retrospectively remembering things that happened prior to 18 years old. Um, and eighth graders obviously, you know, they've got years before they turn eight, 18, um, there could be more experiences to come. Um, not everything they're experiencing right now might necessarily be perceived as still traumatic for them later if they're reflecting back. Um, so, so these questions um, are things that we look at in the survey as, um, you know, these are all things that could be considered traumatic events or, or might align with what we would think of ACEs. Um, and then they're, you know, uh, the best approximation to ACEs that we can do um, with the survey data that we have. 
Thank you, Rachel. I hope that answers that. Um, thanks, Rachel. I appreciate the, the more detail around that. We had another question come up from Dr. Lev. Um, and I believe you're asking about, uh, you know, just how granular we can get in terms of geography with um, data regarding substance use and mental health. Um, from the Delaware School Survey, we are able to create uh, heat maps and we include those in the report of the basic consumption of various substances. Um, that's, they're static maps, they're included in the report. Um, we also have on our website, and Bill, if you could pop in the chat, if you haven't already, because you're pretty on top of these things, um, we do have um, a series of heat maps that allow you to look at trends over time for these things, and you can see geographically those areas. You'll also see geographically those areas where we do not get enough data, so there are some gaps in, in what we're able to report out on. Thank you very much. Phelps. Um, we, so Bill, you'll, you'll pull that in. Thank you. He's already got it in there. It's in the chat. And as I mentioned, we will go ahead and um, at the end of our discussion, when we gather up the materials, the slides will be posted online. And we'll also post a recording of this uh, webinar on our YouTube channel, along with the other recordings that we've had um, of previous sessions. And um, we'll send out uh, we won't send out, but we post along with the meeting materials, all of the links that we included in today's discussion. So you will all have access to all of that. Um, what other questions might you all have um, regarding either the, the products that we've discussed or some of the findings that we've discussed? Was there anything that really jumped out at anyone other than what we've already hit upon? I know for me, one of the things that we observed was just this decline in the perception of risk of substance use across all of the substances. Um, and that's always a little alarming because we do generally see the decline of risk, you know, occurring at the same time we see an increase in use. So that is something that we are keeping our eye on here. Um, and the other thing I think that we thought was, you know, really, Rachel and I were talking, every time we look at that uh, data point around the percentage of overdose, overdose deaths that have to do with fentanyl use, um, it's just, that's really frightening. I mean, on top of everything else, it's just really scary that this is a trend that's, you know, uh, been going on for quite some time and worsening. Rachel, were there any other thoughts that you had as you went through the slide deck and noted different things? Um, no, I mean, I, I think your your point about the, um, you know, keeping an eye on just how many of overdoses are involving fentanyl is, is always what sticks out to me too. And we, we had this, this, this conversation um, that, you know, this overdose crisis that we're in is really a fentanyl overdose crisis at this point. Um, and and it's, it is alarming. Um, it's something to, you know, continue to, to track and, and try and intervene on for sure. Um, yeah, and then I think, um, you know, thinking about particularly with that decline in perception of risk among, of um, marijuana use among students. I think that's the one that we see really occurring in tandem with an increase in use. Um, you know, because alcohol and prescription misuse and some of those kinds of things are, are more or less declining or plateaued at this point. Um, but, but marijuana use, you know, probably in, in conjunction with a lot of shifting laws around legalization, decriminalization of marijuana has impacted this perception of risk and um, the, the normalization of, of use and just the social acceptability of that use. And, and we are seeing that um, change in, in reports of use among students with that particular drug. I think that's the one that's changing the most rapidly other than vaping at this point. Um, I have seen in the reports from other states um, uh, some mapping of the overdose uh, across different counties and even towns, uh, which allows sort of to pinpoint where to allocate resources and what maybe is not going on there in terms of uh, overdose prevention. 
But do we have an access to sort of to look where we see in this overdoses, like in a map uh, spread out through the state? So we we do have a in our um, in the chapter on other legal drugs, I believe it's so chapter six of this report. Um, we do have a, a map of um, overdose death rates across the um, state of Delaware and kind of where those are concentrated. And I think that's um, by zip code. I believe. Um, if you want to email me, if you can um, email me, I can send that to you. Um, our email oh. will be at the end of the slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does the report take into account other substances that were used in addition to the fentanyl for the overdose, or is it strictly just whether it's an over fentanyl related death? Um, you know what? What we have in this in this report, um, I don't believe we have anything that specifically breaks down all of the different substances um, with, involved in an overdose. Um, I would have to look back at it again because we get that data from another um, report. I think the Division of Forensic Science perhaps puts, puts out their overdose death report um, or their annual report, which has um, overdose and accidental death data involved in it. Um, I can circle back to that offline and let you know for sure exactly what, what we have in there, because I know what we report is a watered down version of what they report, and we don't um, splice down overdoses as, as in depth as, as they might. Well, uh, can I uh, make a comment? But usually this, this comes from the coroner's office, and uh, they report on whatever substances are found uh, uh, in um, um, uh, in this deceased person at the time of death. And so the report on fentanyl probably indicates on presence of fentanyl among other substances in, in this particular uh, outcomes. But uh, it's, it's rarely just a single uh, agent. Right, thank you for clarifying that, yes. And I appreciate that. I think what I was thinking about is uh, it, it used to be that fentanyl was typically tied in with heroin use and uh, from what I've seen anyway, from firsthand experience, it's not necessarily the, the going trend anymore, that there's other substances involved and not maybe even heroin anymore with fentanyl. Right, and I, I think as Rachel said, um, we do pull that data from the forensic report and um, we reference the report. So there's probably additional detail in that, uh, but we can take a look at that and, and, and send that out as well. Thank you very much. Sure. Sure. So I just want to um, mention, um, you know, I realized in the beginning I talked a little bit about the SEOW, but I didn't really say what the SEOW is. I said what we do. Um, we are a network of stakeholders throughout Delaware that are interested in the use of data in generating good data sources and pulling it together and disseminating it. And a number of you, and I appreciate this, um, <clears throat> uh, requested that you uh, have information on the SEOW and that you um, can be on the mailing list. And I'm gonna reach back out to anyone who is interested um, in joining the network. It's, uh, it's a very loose network. We want it to be as expansive and inclusive as possible. We want to make sure we're capturing the needs of everyone involved in behavioral health in Delaware, um, you know, seeing what we can do to bring data sources to your use. So uh, I will be following up with that um, after today's meeting and thank you for that. But if anyone wants to reach out, I think Bill popped our, um, well, here it is on the slide. Our email addresses are up there uh, for anyone that wants to reach out. And in the last couple of minutes, I hope she's still in the Zoom room, but um, I did just want to mention that our colleague and the leader of the SEOW for the past 10 years, Dr. Laura Rapp, is um, moving on. Uh, she's going to be leaving her work at the center uh, at the end of this week, and I think many of you in the room know that, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank her for her great leadership over the years and all that she's done to strengthen the SEOW and all of her work here in Delaware. So I just wanted to thank Laura. I don't know if you're available and can um, say a few words, but I- Of just course I will. Are you, right. are you kidding me? Of course I will. Right. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Um, you know, the SEOW is such a special project and it's been my privilege 
to work on it for over a decade now at the Center for Drug and Health Studies with some really amazing colleagues over the years, such as Steve, Roberta, obviously Sharon, Rachel, Misha, Bill, Dana Holtz, and a number of other individuals. And that's just at CDAS, but what makes the SCOW so strong and such an amazing project is the engagement with all of the stakeholders. And that includes everyone on this call, all the email requests that we get, training requests, invitations for manuscript publications, the semi-annual meetings, uh, suggestions for infographics. This project and the um, strength of the SEOW really only comes to life through the engagement of all of you, all the data stakeholders, all the agencies in Delaware, sharing input, recommendations, suggestions, questioning data, asking us to push even further so we can provide data to everyone that's involved in any way in the behavioral health field in Delaware, because the end goal of the SCOW and the end goal pretty much of all of our work is to support and improve the lives of Delawareans. And I really truly feel like um, the SCOW has had a place in supporting all of you and in collaborating with all of you over the years. So thank you for listening to me over the years and for providing feedback and engagement with really a project that's in my heart um, and one that I truly value. So, and I know it's in phenomenal hands um, with my colleagues at CDAS and with all of you with your ongoing contributions. So, thank you. Thank you, Laura. We appreciate that. We appreciate those kind words. And, um, and you're right. And the leadership of the SEOW is going to rest with um, Nasha Scales, MJ Scales, who I think just about everybody in Delaware knows because she is out there and she is making connections all the time. We call her the data ambassador. So I am really grateful that we'll be transitioning to such a wonderful colleague um, in this project. Um, again, we have a couple minutes. If anyone has any final thoughts before we wrap, we would like to thank you for your participation today and, and know that this is just hopefully the start of your using this information and we're here to help you uh, to carry through with whatever your data needs are. Okay. Thank you very much. It was very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Take care everyone. Have a great week.